Fabric is everywhere. It's in your clothes, your furniture, you use it every single day, but on the surface, it doesn't seem like a very exciting topic. When you hear textiles, you think your grandmother's sewing machine, not cutting edge technology. But for much of the last 10,000 years, fabrics and dyes were the technologies that propelled humanity and culture forward. They enabled massive leaps in mathematics, computer science, chemistry, international trade, and so much more. In today's conversation, I'm joined by Virginia Postro, the author of The Fabric of Civilization, to discuss the history of fabrics, the impact they've had on society, and the future of this often underappreciated technology. Hope you enjoy the show. Before we get into today's episode, just a quick message from our sponsor. Today's show is sponsored by Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered transcription tool that takes the best of AI and humans to create better, faster, less expensive transcripts. We'll have more from Stackwork later in the show. Virginia, welcome to episode two of Bookmarked. Thank you for joining me today. I have a lot of questions for you about your book, <laughs> The Fabric of Civilization. But before we get into the many questions I have, I want to first understand what first drew you in to study fabric and the role that it plays in the world. Over a period of probably 15 years or so, I would see a museum exhibit or hear a paper at an academic conference that had some bearing on textile history and particularly its intersection with uh, technology and trade and think, hmm, you know, put it in the back of my mind. Someday I might like to write an article about that. And then in 2014, I went to a, a biannual conference of the Textile Society of America and heard a number of very exciting history papers and met some really interesting uh, historians and thought, you know, I should write an article about this. I wrote an article, um, got a lot of attention. People were interested in it, including some publishers. Would you like to do a book? I wasn't ready at that time, but then a few years later, I did do a, 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 a proposal and, and, and do a book. And along the way, I had also been doing reporting on some more contemporary things about wearables and sort of intersecting with the textile world. So it just struck me that textiles are everywhere. Uh, we've come to take them for granted because they are so abundant and relatively inexpensive these days. Um, but that is a very recent phenomenon in human history. It's actually, re I mean, it's, I'm old enough to remember when, for example, the price of clothes was a much more significant uh, cost in your budget. Um, so I wanted to restore some of that sense of what the role of textiles had been in history, where they come from, and how they connect with technology, science, trade, and the global history of humanity. And it turned out to be a really great lens for looking at all those things. And has this been a lifelong interest for you? Like, have you, exper are you experienced in weaving and, and knitting and, and actually like using textiles before you came up with the idea of writing this book? I don't think I would call it a lifelong interest. I've, I've done little things over, you know, sort of crafty things sporadically over my life. When I was in high school, I sewed, I made costumes. Um, I wasn't particularly good at it, but I did. Um, I actually learned to weave because of the book. I got to a point fairly early in my research where I realized as a somewhat uh, spatially impaired individual that I was not going to understand how looms worked unless I took some weaving lessons and at least on a small scale saw how they went together. And so I went online, found uh, someone who taught nearby and she lent me some table looms of which as the uh name suggests you can put on a table so they're not very big uh and i i got into it and i do really enjoy weaving now and i'm very active in the southern california hand weavers guild but that is 
knew that's because of the book. I, I didn't drive the book and I've never been a knitter. Um, I tried to do some knitting when I was working on the book, but I decided it wasn't for me. Interesting. Well, I have to say I have never been a knitter or a weaver. So a lot of this was new to me and I, I really appreciate a lot of the research you put into the book. It gave me a, a whole new understanding of this world and sparked a lot of ideas. Um, before we get into some of those ideas, can you share maybe a high level overview of the book for listeners who may not have read the book yet? Right, right. Well, okay. So the book is called the, uh, the Fabric of Civilization and the subtitle is How Textiles Made the World. And so what it sets out to do is to tell the story of textiles and tell the story of science, technology, and trade, or science, technology, and economics uh, through the story of textiles globally. From the earliest example is uh, some Neanderthal string that dates 50,000 years ago that's been found uh, to the near future, the things that people are working on now. So that's a very ambitious goal. So the structure of the book is very important. And what I did was I have a sort of, in weaving, you have a warp and a weft, perpendicular threads, and a similar sort of organization is what's in the book. Each chapter has a, a one, a, it, it's a stage in the textile journey from fiber to thread to, to cloth to die and then out into the world. We have traders and consumers. And then there's a final chapter called Innovators, which starts with nylon and brings us up to the present. So you've got that and that can give you some structure, but then that could be a library because there's so much textile history. So then each uh, chapter also has a cross-cutting theme that just tells me as the author, what do I put in and what do I most importantly, what do I leave out? So for example, the, the theme of the chapter on fiber is there's no such thing as a natural fiber. And it looks at how the fibers we know, the biological fibers we know, how they developed and, and how they are products of human artifice, uh, despite their biological origins. And we can talk some about that. The chapter on dye is the, the history of dyes is the history of chemistry. And that history shows you how far you can get with just trial and error with no under, underlying understanding of what's going on, you know, no scientific theory about molecules or whatever. Um, and then how much farther you can go once you have that understanding. So that's the sort of way the book is structured. Awesome. And, you know, one other thing I want to touch on before we dive into the conversation is, you know, fabrics, I think are, as you mentioned in the book, overlooked sometimes as, as key pieces of technology. They're, they're so abundant. They're around us everywhere. I'm wearing them. You're wearing them right now. It's it's everywhere, and yet, for some reason, people tend to just kind of overlook it. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there are a few reasons. The main one is just we, as I say in the book, we have textile amnesia because we enjoy textile abundance. Uh, if you'd gone back a couple hundred years everybody would have thought of the textile industry as a very important industry, as some place where there was innovation taking place. Uh, when, when chemistry student William Perkin was doing an experiment and his experiment turned out to create a purple substance, not what he was looking for, he immediately thought maybe he could make a dye. And that's because this was 1856 in Britain. Uh, he was a student in London and it was a huge industry. And so he, you know, naturally the same way somebody today might think about doing something in software or AI or is a you know, new application of, of uh, large learning models or something like that. In 1856, if you were a chemist and you came up with something that changed color, you would think, oh, a dye, I could start a company, you know, and, and that's what he did. Um, so that's one reason. It's just that at this particular 
place in human history. We don't think about textiles because they, they're just there. I mean, we don't have to think about them. And so uh, there's that. Then there's some other very specific to textile reasons because there are other things, you know, we don't think a lot about paper either. You know, there are other, other technologies industries that are important, but we have so much abundance, we don't really think about them. Um, if you look at archaeology, for example, textile archaeology is very hard because unlike things made out of stone um, or ceramics, even to some extent wood, uh, textiles are unlikely to survive. They only survive in very particular places. Uh, so I talk in the book about uh, a, a piece of cotton cloth that is 6,200 years old that's been dyed with indigo and has stripes and people went to a lot of trouble 6,200 years ago. Well, we have that cloth because it's in an incredibly dry place in Peru uh, where there have been other textile finds. So those are, that's one reason. And textile archaeologists have to be very clever uh, they sometimes find imprints where things have, have been pressed, where uh, something clay was once wrapped in textiles or where uh, they're mineral, uh, there were textiles on something and they mineralized. So the textiles are gone, but the pattern is still there, that sort of thing. So that's another reason. And then the other thing I think that people, this is sort of incorrect, but people think about textiles as women's work. And in fact, there's a very good and well-known book about early textile history called Women's Work, um, because at least spinning has traditionally everywhere been women's work. Weaving and dyeing, it depended on where you were. Um, it's, there are some places where it was women's work and some places where it was deaf. And so when people think about technology, they don't think about looms and spinning machines, even though that's where the Industrial Revolution came from. Uh, they think they, because it's, it's also, I think it's because textiles are soft, squishy. <laughs> and um, people think of technology as being hard and made out of metal or, or sand or something like that. That's really fascinating. Okay, let's start at the very beginning then. This this first chapter about there there's no such thing as a natural fiber. Well, when I walk into the grocery uh, the, the store, let's say a uh, uh, shop, I'm looking for a new T-shirt. I see all sorts of labels, and many of them will say you know natural or organic or some some variation of that term. What do you mean by there's no such thing as a natural fiber? Can you talk a bit well, about I'm that? Yeah, right. So many of our fibers uh, do come from the natural world in the sense that they derive from plants and animals or minerals, if you include asbestos. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but if you think about cotton, which is by far nowadays the largest uh, biologically based uh, fiber, and you think about a field of cotton, field of cotton ready for harvest. It's the fall, it's harvest time. The field is this expanse of essentially waist high plants with big fluffy white bowls on them. Well, none of that is natural. <laughs> cotton is naturally a tree, not, a, not, a, not a, an annual plant. Uh, and in fact, for many Era, in many eras of human history, it was grown more in orchards than in uh, big fields like this. It is not so naturally white. It's naturally left to its own devices. It's kind of tends toward a beige. Um, it's, it's much less abundant. The amount of fiber on the bowl is much less abundant. That's been you know, hybridized over many, many centuries. It's, and it doesn't naturally bloom. Uh, it doesn't naturally uh, have the bowls come out in the fall. I mean, this was the weirdest thing that I learned about cotton is, well, no, it's, it's the weirdest human artifact thing I learned about cotton. Uh, cotton naturally blooms in the fall when the days get short. That is, flowers come. And like any plant, the flowers come first, then the seeds come after. So. 
if you grow cotton outside the tropics in its sort of unmodified state, uh, the flowers will come when the days get short, but the frost will come and kill the flowers and you'll never get the bulbs. So at some point, and it's kind of mysterious why people would do this, but at some point people manipulated or, or selectively bred cotton so that it would bloom earlier and earlier rather than sort of on its natural clock. And that made it possible to grow cotton in all of the regions that are today the world's big cotton regions, whether you're talking about the American South or you're talking about Uzbekistan or parts of China, uh, they're all sort of, they're not, they're not cold regions, but they're regions that do have frost. They're not tropical regions like the ones where uh, cotton develops. So that's that's an example. I mean, if you look at unmodified sheep, they're very hairy, not very woolly. They, they molt. The, the wool sort of comes off. And this is thought to be how people got the idea of spinning it was the sheep would you know, go around and sort of rub up against the bushes and leave their fibers there. And um, so whether it's linen and then, then, then silk is the world's most incredibly artificial thing. <laughs> it's the, 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 uh, the Bombix Mori, the moths can't even survive in the wild. I mean, it's a completely human manipulated process. Yeah. Huh. And you know, I, I think this process is somewhat similar to what you see in agriculture, where fruits and vegetables have been kind of genetically modified or selected in yeah. a sometimes in a slow way in the early days, and now maybe in a faster way when it's more automated. Right. Um, is there any benefit to a more natural or a kind of less modified version of some of these fibers? Because when you look at like food, you sometimes hear people talk right. about how certain crops today have less nutrients in them than some of their, um, you know, uh, previous versions that were, were right. less genetically modified, I guess. So I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is there a benefit to being as natural as possible or, or, you know, or are yeah. we making advances every time we artificially change these fibers? Well, I think, from the point of view of what we're generally trying to get out of the fibers, they have the, I mean, there's a trial and error process and you may decide that a given advance, you want to go back, you know, but the advances have been positive. However, uh, for example, you know, I talked about uh, the cotton being very white and that is because commercially that makes sense. Um, it is, it's a, uh, you know, it's easier to dye if you start with white. Um, and so you can dye it whatever color you want. And you don't have to worry about differences in shades or whatever. However, there are people, um, there's a woman named Sally Fox, who's sort of pioneered that, who have been sort of taking more, this is a different kind of artifice in a sense, that take more natural colors of cotton and work on breeding naturally colored cotton. So you can get brown cotton, uh, beige cotton. Both of those are pretty easy to get, I think. I mean, that's sort of native. And there are places, like I went to Guatemala when I was researching my book, and one of the things that I saw was there, there's a brown cotton that they grow there that has very short fibers. So it's brown and has very short fibers. And that is bad in one sense because it would be hard to dye and it's harder to spin if the fibers are very short. I don't know if I call it luxury. Very meaningful textiles, like the textiles that are used uh, in religious ceremonies or, or say for special occasions. It's very, it's very difficult to make the thread and and uh, with these texts uh, with this cotton but it's it's value because of, so the the natural naturally colored cotton is pretty cool i mean there's green it's not bright these are all subtle shades but you can get sort of greenish cotton pinkish cotton um and and people when i have little show and tell items i have uh, a, a woven thing i got 
from a Mexican weaver that has all different colors of you know, naturally colored cotton or cotton that as it comes off the ball in different colors. So that's pretty cool. It's it's a niche. It's not something that people want. You know, it's not going to take over the cotton market. It's, um, I don't I don't think it's exactly analogous to food in the sense that um, food has a lot of the modifications were for things like making it easier to ship. Um, you know, so the classic thing is tomatoes, you know, <laughs> you can ship them, but they arrive and they're like hard as rocks and sort of rubbery and that sort of thing, as opposed to if you grow them in your garden, they're really right. I don't think there's big differences like that with with fibers. Uh, I think the uh, the selective breeding has very much been to get the characteristics that people value out of them. But it doesn't mean that there aren't some at least niche opportunities for uh, less modified versions. Yeah. One other thing that you highlighted in this section about cotton specifically and some of the transformations, some of the different varieties that people started to to farm was in in the U.S. around. I, I guess this was the, the early eighteen hundreds or maybe the late seventeen hundreds when this early first eighteen hundreds. Yeah. Okay, so this first cotton uh, variety that could withstand temperatures in the U.S. became popularized, and this kind of coincided with the slave trade, right? This was like, a, and then now there's people who can work these fields. And I'd love to dive into the yeah, yeah. economic implications of that and the political yeah. implications of yeah, that's, cotton. Yeah, yeah, that's a really striking uh, coincidence and story that I don't think is very well known on a number of different levels. So in the early settlement period and in the early days of the United States, cotton was not a very big crop. And in fact, the slave trade in was primarily about sugar in the Caribbean. That was, you know, what people were being enslaved to work in, in really horrific conditions uh, in the sugar plantations. Um, but of course, there was a certain amount of slavery in the U United States in, in the, you know, say in 1800. I mean, it 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 was there. But you couldn't really grow cotton in the U.S. for a couple of reasons. One, as you suggested, has to do with you have to find cotton that you can grow above the frost line. Such things did exist. But the other thing uh, is that you had to find cotton that would survive certain diseases uh, that were the, the cotton that they had that they could grow, that would grow in the climate. It was subject to certain diseases, so it wasn't. It was it was very difficult. Around I don't have the date in front of me, but it's roughly 1820. We're, we're talking about like the 1820s. Uh, a cotton variety was discovered in Mexico and brought to the U.S. Um, that did do well, and it did well very importantly in what was then the western frontier of the South, which is. Uh, like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, that, so we don't think of it as very far west today, but that was the Western frontier it was very undeveloped. And what happened as a result of having that cotton that could be grown on plantations and that those newly opened lands where people from the East were starting to settle is that you had a second sort of, you know, um, and, and not a second enslavement, but a second transportation of people. So that there were people who were enslaved in the, the original colonies in Virginia, North Carolina, et cetera, who they were slaves. They weren't, they might be working in tobacco plantations, but they were slaves. They had families, they had roots in these areas. So bad being slaves, good being near your family. This is where this idea of being taken away from your family and sent down the river or sent to the west uh, to the western areas comes from. It's not that it started then, but it started it, more than a million people were taken against their will from the eastern states into these 
what later became, you know, the sort of deep southern states, the cotton belt, uh, because of these new varieties of cotton that could grow in the in those lands. And uh, there's a lot of sort of economic history about the economics of slavery and one this, this I'm afraid I don't have the citation, but the, there's a paper that came out after I did my book that basically says that, that there's always been this tension where people will sometimes assume that the labor of slaves was free to the slaveholder. But that's not true because the slaveholder had to pay for the slaves. And so that's, I mean, it's it's terrible because you're dealing with human beings, but it's just like you have to pay for a tractor. I mean, it's not free, even though it does the work for you. But what's really different is unlike if you had to pay people wages, you also can force them to move against their will. Whereas if they were being paid a wage, they would say, no, I would rather stay with my family in Virginia or you know, stay in North Carolina or whatever. I don't want to go to the frontier and the swamps and <laughs> Alabama or wherever, uh, you know, I don't even know where that is. Um, and so this, this movement of people of, of a million people uh, uh, to these cotton growing regions has profound effects on not only those individuals and their slave and their, their families and their descendants, but also on the history of the United States, um, because uh, you know, I mean, we still live with that today. I mean, you look at the, you look at those region, the, those specific areas. Those are the areas uh, where there's still a lot of residual poverty, and um, and while there's some cotton grown there, it's not no longer the most, the biggest cotton producing states now are Texas and our, and uh, California. But, uh, hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, I mean, and there's so many variables at play here, and, and it's been such a long period of time since then that I, I'm not sure if there's any good or perfect answer to this question, but what do you think the impact would have been if, if that first cotton seed from Mexico that came to the U.S. never came, or if there was no cotton variety that could grow in the U.S.? What would yeah. that mean for America today? That's a very good question. I mean, the question that I thought about instead was, what if those new, newly opened areas had been subject to the same laws that uh, the Northwest Territories were subject to, which is like oh, places like Ohio and, you know, the sort of if you go north there, the, the was the frontier on the north. And one of the things that was part of the Northwest Ordinance, which set up how these places would be set, was that slavery was prohibited. So if if slavery had only been allowed in the original states, I think it would have, with or without cotton, I think it would have died out, um, you know, because it would, it, 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 and those states would have had to be settled the way the North West territories were settled, you know, you'd have more immigrants, you, it would just be a very different thing. Um, in terms of cotton, um, I mean, I think that eventually there would have, if it hadn't happened then, I think it would have happened at another time because there, I mean, long before the settlement of, you know, of Europeans in the Americas, there were varieties of cotton that were known to grow above the frost line. I mean, you can go back to the early days of Islam and when you have cotton um, spread very rapidly because there were religious reasons for people to wear it. Uh, um, and some, I mean, obviously a lot of that is in places that are quite warm, but there were places that were uh, above the frost line. So there were already, um, varieties that could grow in slightly cooler climates. Um, but yeah, yeah but, I, but I do think that um, it, it certainly accelerated. If you were allowed to have slavery in these places that were good for growing cotton, you would take advantage of it. And that, you know, is, 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 is difficult <laughs> to, uh, to, 
to think about, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to transition to kind of another phase in your book here where the, some of the farming stuff and the, the cotton stories were interesting, but they made sense to me. They were like intuitive that, oh, okay, this, this effect or this cause led to this effect in, in cotton farming. But when you got into the section about math and computing and the, <laughs> the parallels with fabric there, my mind was blown. I mean, I had no understanding that there was anything at all related to that fabrics were in any way related to math or computers. Can you talk a bit about that connection for me? Yeah, and that's a that's a tricky one because it's a lot of little examples. So basically the theme of the uh, of the chapter on cloth is that cloth is uh, evidence of mathematics in the tangible world that cloth is embodied code. Um, and the simplest way to think of this is weaving is the original binary operation. You're either raising a, a thread or lowering a thread. You're either going over or under. It's all ones and zeros. Um, and, and But there's a lot of it, math has been called the science of patterns. And there's a lot there are a lot of mathematical principles that are used in making cloth, um, whether you're weaving or you're knitting. Um, uh, knitting, it gets into three dimensionals and topology and all, all this kind of thing. But um, there are ideas uh, of, of symmetry, for example, I mean, in certain cultures, symmetry, like in, in the Andes, which Incas and tr traditional Andean weavers today were very highly developed textile culture, really, textile art. Um, they use symmetry to remember patterns and to repeat patterns and to vary patterns. They you know, sort of, they don't write it down. They, they do it with these sort of principles. Um, there's an idea that the, some of the early math, Greek math comes out of weaving. And, and first thing you have to understand is that in ancient Greek culture, weaving is not something that, you have to be a weaver to know about. It's like really super central. It's in the religion. It's, it's particularly in Athens. Um, it's it's a very central activity for typical, you know, garments or household textiles or even decorative textiles. It's done by women, but there are special religious things where men do it. Um, Everybody's got looms in their homes. I mean, it's just very central. Everybody knows about it. Uh, it's re related to Athena, the goddess. And in, in fact, the, the the word technology comes from the same word as the word to, to weave. So there's a theory, which is controversial, that the arithmetic uh, chapters of Euclid's elements, which are the chapters about what we would call today number theory. That is the relations of odds and evens, of primes, of you know how numbers relate to each other. That those actually are um, sort of a, a genius mathematician, probably not Euclid. It was believed that that's earlier than Euclid used, but put together theories that weavers were using in their everyday lives. So one of the examples is what's been called the granddaddy of all algorithms, which is division by subtraction. And the idea is you've got a big number and a little number. You want to know if the big number is divisible by the little number. The way you can do that is just keep subtracting the little number until you either get zero or a remainder. And this, by the way, is more or less the way I learned how to do division back in the 1960s, new math. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, they were getting us ready for the computer age, which is this is how computers do division. Well, the idea is that if you were weaving a one thing, if you're weaving a pattern that has a certain, repeats every certain number of threads, let's say 13 threads, and you want to know if that's going to fit evenly across your, your fabric, you can take 13 threads from each side of the loom until you get to the middle and have either zero, <laughs> in which case you're good, or some remainder, in which case you need to add or subtract threads to get it, uh, uh, get rid of it. So, and and if, when you're dressing a loom, when you're 
planning weaving, you have to think about primes. I mean, you may not have the concept of prime numbers, but things that don't have any thing, any divisors are, um, you know, that's relevant to weaving. So you have all this kind of thing. And then, of course, the the thing that people know at least vaguely about is uh, Joseph Marie Jacquard's uh, punch card attachment. So now we're going from ancient Greece all the way rushing up to the 19th century. Um, there, there was a kind of weaving, if you want to make a design of like flowers or birds or something that is uh, is more like a painting than something geometrical. Uh, that's very hard to do in weaving because you have to lift threads in, you have to select threads individually rather than being able to lift, you know, every third thread all the way across a, a, a one, one pass across the loom. So there were these very complicated looms called draw looms that somebody had to stand and pull, not the weaver, the second person had to stand and pull cords and couldn't store the patterns you only want one kind it's a very complicated very valuable very you know, luxurious kind of uh, silk weaving in, in particularly in france uh, and it's also their version is also in china well jacquard building on the work of a couple of other people who came before him came up with this way where you have a, a punch card which is a, a cardboard or wood card that has holes and each hole tells you whether or not, if there's a hole you lift a thread and if no if you're, it doesn't matter for the but if you have there's a hole you don't lift a thread if there's not a hole you do that just has to do with the way the mechanics of it work uh, and each card represented one pass across the loom and you could string them all together and this was a way of automating this formerly very very complicated process and it really was a a revolution in weaving and even today if you go to a traditional weaving workshop in some place like Venice or Florence there's some they're actually using these 19th century looms they're not weaving like they did in the renaissance because that would be way too hard <laughs> <laughs> it's still impressive compared to you know a factory automated loom but it is but it's uh 19th century. Anyway, so these were these, they take this idea of a program. It's not ex technically a program, but it, it takes this idea of having a card that represents an action in this very uh, stylized way. And Charles Babbage, who was the original theorist of what we know as computing, had this idea for the analytical engine, which would make would would as Ada Lovelace said weave algebraic patterns the way the jacquard loom weaves a uh, uh, cloth. Uh, so he saw this and it was he thought this could a similar system could work to make what he envisioned. He never actually built the analytic engine, but it's a very important concept. And if you go forward in history, even in the you know nineteenth and 1960s, 70s, even into the 80s, people were using punch cards to carry computer programs and data, um, taking that idea. Wow. It's fascinating that, that weaving had so many fundamental uh, applications. It, it was so fundamental to both math thousands of years ago and and computing now and it's kind of like ushered in if, if you think about computing in the earliest days I, I don't think anyone was thinking that this this weaving strategy was going to like create the internet or enable all these <laughs> cool things that it has today yeah yeah no and in fact the earliest um some of the early computer memory was actually woven uh, it was uh, copper wire. It was called magnetic core memory, and it was copper wires that were literally woven. It's just like cloth, um, at, with a tiny little magnetic donut at each intersection and uh, a, a diagonal wires that carried current that could flip the donut from positive to negative or vice versa. And that was your bit. 
and and that's an example the people who invented that were not weavers they weren't thinking about weaving but they ended up with a weaving woven structure because of the intrinsic binary nature of weaving and i think was that part of the uh mission to go to space was that was that code used in uh, in the actually, first Apollo missions yeah so it i mean that would have been used in that era but the there's also something called uh, rope memory, which is a similar idea, um, but it, it works a little bit differently. But it, it was also a kind of woven memory, and it's it's sort of like the 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 magnetic core memory is kind of like RAM, random access memory, and uh, uh, and the rope memory was like ROM read only memory. So that would that was just that would that held the programs um, as opposed to data uh for it yeah right okay that's really interesting so you had to get it yeah but it was yes the, the woven forms of memory were used in the space program yeah have you seen the movie hidden i think it's hidden figures yeah the women yeah. that helped kind of program some of the early space exploration yeah. i i did see that movie and i did read that book but that's not the same that's i mean okay that, they're they're doing programming but it's and and so it might have been done there's no hardware in that movie is what i'm trying to say right <laughs> so there's some layers of abstraction yeah, there from yeah, right, the foundations right. of weaving exactly. to where they yeah. got right i say right. now i want to understand um you know sometimes when when a technology comes out it uh pe people kind of use it and um continue using it beyond its you know useful life i think of like i think of like the qwerty keyboard for example yeah. like it was useful in typewriters because it stopped keys from getting jammed now that we no longer have that problem we still use it because it, we've inherited this thing and it's kind of like just the way we all learn to type but right. it's not the most efficient way well um, that's a controversial <laughs> That's a controversial point. I, I don't want to go that's down fair. that rabbit hole. But <laughs> okay, so that's fair. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Let's but. call that controversial. But I want to understand if there's any of that in weaving, where, you know, weaving, setting the foundation for some of these math algorithms, setting the foundation for some of the early computing. Can, are, are there disadvantages to having used weaving as the foundation? for some of this stuff. Like if we look back, if we were to now design computers from scratch, could we have said, you know, let's not use weaving as the example here. Let's do it a different way and maybe we'll get a different outcome. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, I think we already have basically, unless you say, let's not use binary, you know, let's not use ones and zeros. Um, and I think that's, think we probably would have gone down that road even without we even if even if we only knitted or whatever we only we only had felt um uh i think it was really the 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 really literal interaction um you know people went away from the magnetic core memory and and the rope memory into chips into embedding things in silicon so we already moved away from that and and the same thing with punch cards. I mean, you know, we don't store programs on punch cards or or or, or punched tape. I mean, the, the idea of putting holes in paper uh, as a way of storing data went away, you know, decades ago. So I I think in a sense we all it it's not like query. It, it, it didn't stick around beyond its useful life. It it sort of help things get to a certain point and then other ways uh took it up yeah right okay so it sort of acted more as a catalyst and yeah or an early stage you know it's, um particularly i mean the punch cards and the idea of you know representing that with holes in something and that being um related to mechanical i mean all this also has to do with the fact that weaving is a mechanical process and if you're trying to move things around you know you can use the whole absence or presence of a hole to to do that and then we went more into an electron you know into electronics from mechanics so i i think there has been an evolution there away from 
the things that are rooted in weaving. But it's interesting to see the the the, the earlier days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now that you know, now it's. Um, I know we're going to talk later about current uh, current efforts, but you know, now what people are trying to do is as as chips have gotten so 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 small uh is to put them into fibers so that then you can you know weave your intelligence or knit your intelligence into a garment or into a tent or into you know whatever you might you know, backpack and in, into whatever you might uh be needing uh, to have some functionality in and that's the early days but that's that's the other you know it's like full circle <laughs> right that's really interesting. One other thing that I was fascinated by was the section in the book where you talk about how when dyeing fabric, so you mentioned this this example of the, the cloth that was found 6,200 years ago and how there was dye in it. And you were kind yeah. of asking this question of like, why was that there? Like, did dye, it wasn't necessarily for survival that you needed yeah. blue colored dye, but it was there. And yeah. you kind of trace through the history of dye. And I loved hearing about how all these, uh, I guess, empirical chemists that didn't even know they were chemists were, were kind of just experimenting with different plants and different things that could potentially lead to a fabric being turned into a certain color. But they had no idea that molecules existed. They had no idea of any of this stuff. Right. Uh, I thought that was an incredible example of innovation and how it how it often comes about. Just that you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, that people have to know the underlying science. Experimenting on its own may be enough to start to start getting results before the actual science is is understood. Yeah, I mean the the great thing about dye, and I compare it to in just in one sense. Unlike medicine or magic, <laughs> the thing about dye is you can tell cause and effect more. I mean, you, you don't maybe know the molecular cause and effect, but you know, if I use this iron pot and I dye in the iron pot, I get this result. If I use this clay pot and I dye in the clay pot, I get this different result. If everything else, I mean, and, and you know, the more careful you are, about holding things constant, the more you can tell, you know, well, if I just change this one thing, I get these different results. So you you get the results and the results are more or less consistent. I mean, you're still dealing with, there's a certain differences in, you know, the amount of the dye stuff in this leaf versus that leaf or whatever, but, but you can tell. And so people could develop expertise based on their empirical, uh, learning uh, over time and um uh, and pass it down and, and what's interesting is if something like indigo and indigo today we know mostly as the blue and blue genes um uh, which is in most cases a synth synthesized indigo but it's the same chemical uh it, it comes from plants and what's interesting is it was developed all around the world from different plants that aren't even related to each other, but they all have the same chemical inside the plant. And, you know, so I mentioned Peru, there's indigo in India, that hence we, that's where we got the name. There was a, a, a version of indigo called woad in Europe. You, throughout Africa, you find it in Asia, you know, it's pretty much everywhere. I don't think Australia had it, but, but it was developed, you know, many different places that didn't have contact with each other. And it's an incredibly complicated process. Uh, you have to, because it, you can get the idea pretty easily because the indigo leaves in water with maybe some ash in it you know, you'll get a blue, but it's like a blue pigment that is, you could paint with it, but you couldn't get it to go into clothes. And you have to do a transformation to get it to permeate uh, textiles. And it, they come out green and turn blue in the air as it oxidizes. It's a crazy process. It's really interesting. If anybody has a chance to take an indigo workshop, uh, they're often given because people, people like to die with indigo because it's cool. But it's amazingly complex chemically, and yet people came up with it. And 
I think it says something about the very deep desire to have beauty, meaning uh, things beyond just the function of having clothes or bags or whatever you might be making from your textiles. Um, and of course, blue is not the only blue, not the only color that people figured out how to make. Um, there, you know, there's stories about red. I talk about the famous uh, Tyrian purple, the uh, ancient, uh, very valuable dye of, of the ancient world. Um, the, the purple, it's really more like the color of congealed blood, but <laughs> the, that was on Roman togas, and it was it was traded in the. Uh, throughout the ancient world. Uh, it came from a shellfish. Um, and it has some of the same chemicals in it as indigo, actually, uh, but also some other ones. So anyway, it's, yeah, it's quite interesting. And so, and then when you start to have um, the beginnings of some notion of chemicals science in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, you people want to apply it to dyes uh, because dyes are very valuable. Textiles are an important industry. Um, and they also are, they're desperately trying to figure out how to make dyes scientific. And they, tr they, they waste a lot of time trying to apply Newton's optics, which don't apply to dyes. Uh, um, but, but there's, it's a lot of, if you wanted to be on the cutting edge of chemical science, you know, the best job was to be the inspector of the dye works in, uh, in uh, uh, France, which was less like a bureaucrat with a clipboard that you may be picturing and more sort of like a chief scientist for France. But it's only in the late 18th century uh, that sort of the ideas of oxygen and molecules and all these sorts of things start, people start to figure it out. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it's only in 1856 that William Perkin uh, for, synthesizes the first synthetic lab-made dye, um, it, which is what becomes known as Moog. It's a, it's a purple dye. And then mm -hmm. that, he, he uses this sort of industrial waste product called coal tar to do that. And then from that, lots of other people get the idea and they start, you know, I can, he made purple, I can make green, I can make, make eventually get synthetic indigo, um, you know, make all these colors. And that really is a revolution. Uh, it's a revolution for textiles. It changes the way the world looks because suddenly you have a lot more variety of color and more vivid colors. And it also creates the chemical industry because suddenly you have this big industrial demand for synthetic chemicals and everybody goes around, you know, they start dye works and they hire a lot of chemists. And then while you've got all these chemists, you've got this company, you know, you might as well look into other things. So you start to get medicines like Bayer, Bayer aspirin fame. They start as a dye works. You get explosives. You get glues. You get, you know, and and then in the 1930s you get synthetic fibers and plastics, um, or the kinds of plastics. There's there's plastics before that, but the kinds of plastic we know today. So it comes full circle. So that it, it the chemists then start creating new forms of textiles. Wow. So. Was is it true then that the textiles were and, and the dyes used in them were the driving force that enabled a lot of these, you know, chemical revolutions and, and the chemical kind of like, um, I guess just growth in in chemistry overall. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well. Okay. So there were people who were interested in chemistry as a science, just you know, understand the world, general curiosity, although. Um, some of those people even got, because it was so lucrative and so, there was so much demand, would get pulled into dyes. But yes, dyes were the first big chemical industry application, dyes and inputs into dyes. Um, so this so, was even before things like, like you mentioned Bayer aspirin. So, so before people were even thinking of using chemicals for like health use cases, they well, were looking they were at thinking, through dyes. Well, the interesting thing is, Actually, William Perkin, what he was trying to do, and he failed, 
was to make an anti-malarial drug called Quine. So people had the idea that you might be able to synthesize certain things that were medicinal chemicals that were found in nature and were, you know, hard to get because the plant or whatever was difficult. But dyes were the first big success. So you have all these Uh. things bubbling around saying, like, could we do this? Could we do that? Um, and dyes were this big success. And and keep in mind, the textile industry is like one of the biggest, in, I mean, still one of the biggest industries in the world. So, it, you know, the 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 amount, uh, you could sell a lot of dye. <laughs> um, uh, and so that was sort of like the first big general application of uh, mm-hmm. of industrial chemistry was or chemical engineering was to make dyes. And then these companies um, that were formed and the, the German companies became the, the leading ones. Um, right. Would then make other things, you know, they would, they would use their chemical know-how to, you know, they'd launch a branch in, in some other field. So they, the ideas of, you know, you could do these things were out there, but, the first sort of killer app, if you will, uh, of, of synthetic, particularly organic chemistry was for dyes. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. To see the results for yourself, you can check out my personal website where I host transcripts for all my podcast episodes. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. If we take a step further back, so if dyes were the first kind of killer app of chemistry in its industrial applications, what was the fir- what was the mo- driving motivation for dyes in the first place? Was it just to look cooler than the next guy? Like I got a blue shirt and you don't, yeah, and so you know I'm cooler than you, that kind of thing. We don't know. I mean, because it's so long ago, we don't know. Um, uh, you know, I generally divide you know, the things into function, pleasure, and meaning. So function. This goes back to my old book from 2003, uh, The Substance of Style. But so function, that's self-explanatory and dyes don't play much of a role in that. Um, Pleasure is just, you know, you enjoy it and meaning can take different forms. So one is the one that you mentioned, which is status. And that's definitely a factor. I mean, you see that with the Tyrian purple, the ancient Romans were actually wearing stinky clothes because unlike other dyes the smell doesn't wash out when you clean it um and they were wearing these stinky clothes to prove that they had the real expensive dye not a fake dye you know because there are other ways to get purple i mean you can the main one being you dye red and then you dye over it in blue um but you know this showed you have the real thing um so that's clearly a status thing going on there. That's, <laughs> and we know that, I mean, we know experimentally that it stank because I, I write about a, a woman, an archaeologist who did these recreations and she has 20 year old samples that have been washed in Tide and they still smell. But we also <laughs> know because there's satirical poems from ancient Rome about stinky rich people, you know, and their stinky clothes. <laughs> so is that um, where the term, stinking rich came from like <laughs> that's a good question i don't know <laughs> huh. probably not but you could it makes a good story um so status is one but there are other forms of you know um it could be a religious significance uh, we know in in the uh hebrew scriptures there's a, a dye called tehelet which is a form of blue uh which probably comes from these same snails um that has religious significance. Uh, it could be a marker of a particular ethnic group or a caste or, you know, any kind of group affiliation. I mean, think about 
sports teams and their colors. Uh, uh, you could have that in, in any form. So, so there are different reasons, different ways we use the colors that dyes create, uh, but we don't know why originally. I mean, my, my guess is originally it was just pleasure that people liked the way it looked. Um, and then once people had dyes, they started to have other kinds of meanings, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, that it could be status. It could be some kind of identity, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. That's really interesting. It's an important reminder, I think, to recognize that even though status is like, it's often a zero sum game. It often looks silly to outsiders um, or, or even like religious or ceremonial purposes. They may not immediately be obvious in their value. If you trace this back far enough, these may have been the early, you know, catalysts that got the chemistry revolution going in the 17th and 18th century, which is, right. it's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of that was, you know, when we look, um, whether you're talking about the jacquard looms or, or what they replaced the, the, the draw looms, or you're talking about, um, the dyes. I mean, a lot of that was driven by luxury fabrics, luxury, you know, things that were, quite superfluous to the to the general public um, you know, um so in the sense that what happened was it, it led to these revolutions that then made these things available to the average person so, so certainly things like you know you started to get woven portraits uh from the jacquard loom um not just for you know royalty but even People would get, I, I forget when this is, this is probably like, this might be in the World War One, or it might, it's later, you know, but people would get like a woven portrait of their son who went off to war, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. Right. Um, and that's a pattern I think that still exists in technology today where, you know, something, the, the first iteration of something might only be available for the richest people. I think right. of like, I think of Uber a lot and I go like, oh, private limo drivers were only available 20 years ago to the, the really wealthy people. Now right. everyone has one. You have them for yeah. your food now. And same <laughs> with Airbnb. You got, you know, it, instead of having 10 vacation homes, which very few people can afford, you have millions at, at your disposal and you get to pick which one you want whenever you want. So it's interesting to see that that same trend has kind of continues through, depending on the technology, it, it just, it starts typically at the, the highest end and eventually is democratized so that everyone can get access to it. Um, one other topic I want to talk about is automation and efficiency. And uh, you, you specifically talk about the Luddites. And uh, I think many people in tech are probably familiar with that term Luddite. But uh, I forgot that, I think I knew this a while ago, but I totally forgot that the origin of the movement was in, in weaving. And so, you know, that idea that um, people, you know, are, are trying to get in the way of progress, I think is very uh, relevant to today's tech landscape as well. I, I think a lot about AI and the, the parallels there between the Luddite movement of burning down, you know, automated, uh, I think these were automated looms, correct? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we have to go back before the Luddites uh, to get the full story. With the, okay. So, but the first, the first point is that the Luddites were not anti-tech ideologues. They were not. This uh. were, they were not philosophers. They were just guys who didn't want to lose their jobs. Okay, and that is very relevant to a lot of our discussion today. Um, they were hand loom weavers, so they were. Um, you know, body powered loops. They were enjoying the benefits of having mechanically spun thread. So in the late 18th century, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, all thread had to be hand spun, which means that somebody had to sit there and draw out fiber, twist it, and extend it to make it long and strong, and 
pick it up and make you know, bobbins full of thread. And then that thread would be woven into cloth. And it takes a lot of thread to make anything. So, for example, the cloth in a pair of blue jeans is roughly uh, six miles of thread. And before the Industrial Revolution, before mecha mechanized spinning, uh, the fastest, best spinners in the world were Indian women spinners, uh, especially with cotton. And it would take about 100 hours to spin the amount of thread that was needed to make a pair of blue jeans uh, or a pair of trousers in, in those days. So 100 hours for one pair of pants. That's a lot of time. And the result of that is it's a very, even at its highest, most productive version, it's a very low productivity activity. Um, spinners are paid very little because, not because people are mean, <laughs> but because it takes so long to make anything that if they were paid more, nobody could afford any cloth. That day. So you also have a phenomenon where in the late 18th century, it's taking 20 or 30 spinners for every weaver in the north of England. There's a guy who went around and recorded this sort of thing. And even with all of, basically every woman was spinning, uh, even with all that spinning, uh, the weavers sometimes didn't have enough thread. They didn't have the input. So that was the bottleneck in the production of cloth. And everybody knew it would be great to automate it. And through various stages, it does in the late 18th century, you do eventually get spinning machines, water-powered, uh, and then later coal-powered spinning machines so that one person can operate lots and lots of spindles and suddenly thread is abundant, which is a huge, so that's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, first of all. It starts with these spinning machines, huge jump in productivity. And for roughly a generation, about 25 years, weavers enjoy what one historian calls a golden heyday because now they're no longer sitting around waiting for the, to have enough thread. They've got all the thread they need, but they're still doing it the old slow way, mechanical. And so they're getting high, they've got their thing, they're getting all the work they need. They're doing very well for about a generation. And then Power, then looms get mechanized. So the same process that happened with spinning happens with weaving, and the Luddites are the re rebels against that. Now, there were people, when the spinning machines were introduced, there were also people, they don't get, a, they don't have a name, <laughs> but there were people who protested those, who broke them up, who petitioned car Parliament, who rioted. I mean, there's a certain amount of that stuff against the spinning machines again. But basically, the Luddites are people who were the winners of technological progress for basically a generation and then were the losers. Um, and, and it was a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal for them because if you were losing your livelihood and, you know, this is roughly the turn of the, the, you know, roughly 1800 or so, uh, you know, you could starve. I mean, it was it was serious business. It wasn't like getting laid off from a tech company you know, in in twenty uh, first century America. But that was what it was about. It was about this idea that increasing productivity means losing jobs, and therefore it's bad. And that is very much the same argument that we see today. Um, and yet increasing productivity is the only way you get out of poverty. Um, it, you, you don't get out of poverty by, you know, having everybody spin um, and or everybody do hand weaving. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the, the, the first step was that the spinning became automated. And so for those who aren't familiar, I think the spinning, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is you're taking the actual fibers and you're turning it into a thread that can be used yeah. then in weaving. Right. right. And then so the the first step was the spinning became automated, but you said that didn't really create like no one remembers that part. No yeah. one calls well, that the pre Luddite I mean, term. You know, part of it has to do with who the display I mean there were people who protested and I write in the book about some of the protests against the the spinning machines and, and um but the 
the spinners who were being unemployed, first of all, the, some of them got reemployed, um, although a fraction, but they were also, I mean, I don't want to push this too far because I don't know that this is the case, but we may not remember them as much because they were um, they were people doing peace. They were not working in workshop. They were working in their homes. They were um, and they were women. Um, they but they were important sources of family income. So it was it was significant, um, but. They didn't have a slogan, I guess. They didn't have, you know, Ned Ludd, the mythic Ludd. Ludd. I, we we don't remember them as, as much. Um, and and but there were definitely, you know, if if you think that you should never have technological unemployment, uh, you're saying you think that we should be poor. We should mm-hmm. be, you know, it's. Um, the real question is, is there anything, especially today when we're much richer society that we can do to ease the transition for people who are displaced? I don't have a good answer to that, but it's, 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 it's easier to answer in or easier to address in the 21st century than it was in the 18th. Yeah. So for all the different examples throughout human history of technology, a new technology displacing jobs, why do you think the Luddite kind of movement or revolution, why do you think we remember and, and grasp onto that one versus all the hundreds, the countless examples of technology displacing people's jobs? What was, was there anything special specifically about that? Well, I think it was part, I mean, I don't know I mean, for sure. I mean, partly it is just good marketing, <laughs> but you know, they had a name uh, as opposed to just we're protesting this. Um, I think it's also this, this untold story or rarely told story that they had been the winners and then they were the losers. I think that is, um, probably part of it is that people tend to think that when their job is, you know, doing well, um, because of the current state of technology, that that makes them better. <laughs> um, that that they, you know, what, uh, and and so, if you're in your golden heyday period, um, you tend to think that that's the way the world should be. That 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 there's something virtuous about that. Um, as opposed to this is just the state we happen to be in now and you know it's going to be different in the future um and you know whatever merit i have as a human being is not from my economic value at this moment in the history of technology um and i right. think that's that's worth um uh, worth technologists thinking about um that that it's it's you know the fact that you are very valuable in today's market does not make you a better human being than the person who got laid off from the auto industry or whatever <laughs> yeah that's really interesting so the luddites had this generation of a tailwind an economic tailwind yeah. They had, a, they had a generation of an economic tailwind. Now, most of these people would have been people who either themselves or in their families had been weavers before the economic tailwind. But mm-hmm. yeah, they had that, that had that generation of the golden heyday. Yeah. Right. And so I'm thinking about that economic tailwind that the Luddites had, where, where the spinning part was automated, but the looms had not yet been automated. Right. I think a lot about the parallels to. Uh, maybe maybe journalism today, where for for I guess through the fifties, through the turn of the century, uh, every town had their own local newspaper. Really? The journalists had the a pretty stable job, pretty good job. It was kind of a monopoly that the, there would be like one or two local newspapers, and then you have I guess it's almost a double whammy. You had Facebook, you have the social media era, 
And then now you have AI maybe kind of compounding yeah, that I, pressure. Yeah. On you. So there's not much left to journalism, but <laughs> I can speak <laughs> to this from experience, but uh, in terms of business models. Um, yeah. So up until I'm trying to think, I mean, the early 2000s, you know, 2005, maybe journalism is still pretty viable, but it's, it's headed downward. And there's a lot of things going on there. Um, it there is the, there is the loss of classified ads, which were just like a license to print money. I mean, they were so lucrative, um, and you, that was lost to Craigslist and then to more specialized, you know, job job placement things, and um, and and then. You also have uh, with e-commerce, e you have consolidation of, of retail, which is another big source of, of ads for local newspapers. So you get that. And then and then even just the way people get their news changes. It's not I mean, social media accelerates it. But even before that, people are starting to. In, instead of having like just each local newspaper, people are starting to get these kind of global uh, or national uh, kinds of things. So yeah, so there's definitely a lot of technological unemployment in, in journalism and, it, and the nature of journalism changes as a result and uh, what people write and what draws traffic. Um, it's a long, complicated story, uh, but it definitely, and I think that this does color the way journalists cover technology. I mean, I have to say, right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sympathetic because I mean, I, I can say like when I get paid, what I got paid in the nineties, I'm a happy camper, you know, and there are very few people who would say that, you know, professionals, uh, but journalists are, are among them. I mean, we've been big, big losers in um, e economically from the technological revolutions. Now as consumers, I mean, I have to say I've been a big winner and even the ability to write a book like this is um i couldn't have done it only with the internet and thank god i finished it before the pandemic or i would have been in big trouble because even the libraries were closed um let alone doing any on-site research uh, but it certainly makes it easier to get materials and, and and set up interviews and do things like that so yeah that's definitely uh, yeah, I, I mean, yes, AI threatens journalism. It threatens some of the, uh, but it doesn't threaten it as much. I mean, the the big whammies to journalism have already taken place. That's fair. Are there any examples of people uh, opposing a new technology, whether for job security or for any other reason, and having like one out? Because it seems like the the eventual outcome of all these efforts to oppose a new technology, whether it's the Luddites or whether it's journalism, uh, you know, attacking tech or any of this stuff, it seems that the eventual outcome is that technology just keeps moving forward and people keep advancing. And, and you know, it's, it's just a temporary measure, uh, a temporary stop against that progress, but eventually it finds a way. Are there any examples where that the opposition has actually managed to stop technology in its tracks? Off the top of my head, partly because we're in the the uh, the world of textiles. I mean, one that comes to mind, which didn't win out in the long run, but was so people had the con. Uh, there was a guy in in the Elizabethan period, so this is going back to the 16th century, um, who came up with a way of a, a machine to make stockings. Um, and this is it's more like a loom than like it's not like a powered machine but it but it's faster and when he proposed it and he wanted to get like a royal warrant or whatever you know something from the queen queen elizabeth she didn't want to, she didn't approve it because she was afraid that it would put people out of work from knitting stockings now the stocking frame was eventually uh, adopted partly because it started with doing 
silk stockings. And in fact, it was one of the, the, the stocking frame knitters were big users of the, uh, the early spun yarn for, for cotton spinning from the Industrial Revolution. So it did eventually catch on. It just didn't catch on quite as fast. Um, I mean, I can think of other things. I mean, super, you know, in my life, I'm supersonic. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Air transport. Jet. I mean, and now, but that wasn't because people were afraid it was going to get rid of jobs. But, uh, you know, that was, you know, I don't understand what the big deal about sonic booms are. When I was a little kid, we used to hear them all the time. But, <laughs> but I guess people didn't like them. <laughs> but, you know, so, so we can think of, um, and, and there are things, I mean, it, it, it's, this is not global, but India has had a, a sort of industrial policy of trying to maintain employment by having a fairly large handloom sector and also, um, somewhat smaller, but a certain amount of hand spinning. And it's very, it's very tied in with ideas of Indian nationalism and, um, you know, Gandhi spinning to protest British spun, you know, a lot of, but we, in the U.S., we had hand spinning to protest British spun yarn too in the revolution. But then once we won, we went back to buying spun factory yarn. Uh, but India has had a policy, uh, you know, for many decades of, supporting its handloom sector as a means of mass employment. Now, the handloom sector in India, I mean, many of those people are amazing artisans. And uh, they really do uh, fine, fine work. But unless they're doing it for the luxury market at high prices, they're only going to be paid small wages. So you've got to it's like a prescription for poverty. If you want to preserve like the cultural, I don't know, the, the cultural knowledge, you, maybe there's some way you can subsidize or whatever a, a, a sector to provide luxury goods, but you're never going to get out of poverty if everybody's making cloth by hand. Um, right. I don't know all the, I haven't delved into all the particulars of that policy and over time, uh, even the hand the handloom sector is the big big um, agitator for being able to get you know yarn from uh, China and <laughs> because they need cheap inputs. Uh, so it's complicated, but uh, that that is a case where I think uh, trying to preserve jobs at the expense of you know rather than just pulling the ripping the band-aid off i understand the politics of it india is a democracy it's a lot of people who, and 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 it is poor and, and you're in a world where losing your job could mean serious deprivation uh, but it is not the way out of poverty right on the topic of government policy there was another thing that i read in the book that was fascinating to me that i believe it was people in florence and even in china uh, once had to pay taxes and fees and get licenses for wearing certain fabrics. And I was just blown away by that. Like, I, I really don't understand how that was something that like today, that idea seems so silly that like in order to wear a piece of clothing, I'd have to pay a tax for that. But, uh, you know, how do governments get away with that? That's I think yeah. was like five, 600 well, years ago. Yeah. So there, these are, you're referring to what are called as the category sumptuary laws. And mm. typically sumptuary laws work like this. And China would be a good example. We have a hierarchy um, of groups in society. You know, we, we recognize them, you know, we want to keep, and we want to keep, and, and, and we want to keep that hierarchy. So we'll have, you know, if you're a soldier, you're higher ranking than if you're a merchant or if you're a priest or a scholar, or, you know, it varies from society to society. And one way we're going to enforce that is we're going to require people in different groups to wear or rather to not wear certain clothes. 
So in China, where it was all about enforcing a Confucian hierarchy, it was very elaborate. And this goes through different dynasties. It's maintained. Um, it, it would be how big your sleeves were, what colors, like only yellow, only the emperor and the empress can wear yellow. Uh, it, it would be what what kinds of fabrics. If, if you were a merchant or anyone in your family was a merchant, you couldn't wear maintaining a certain social structure, certain social hierarchy. Now, it wasn't always kept. Um, sometimes even the emperor would give presents of things that to people who that where they they were being given a present by the emperor that was fancier than what they were supposed to be legally able to to um wear but at least in china even when people were violating it they were maintaining that status hierarchy like it, it was one on one you had a very similar laws in japan that were also based on confucian hierarchy um and that would tell people, you know, on, only, I'm going to get this wrong, but like, only samurai can wear this certain kind of brocade. And if you're a merchant, you can't wear it and you can't have anything flashy on your outside. What happened in Japan was different from what happened in China, because in Japan, at least in the city of Edo, which is now Tokyo, um, the social prestige, as opposed to official um, sort of Confucian prestige, accorded to rich merchants and actors is much more like the society we have today. <laughs> um, and, and they developed their own styles within the law. So for example, the outside of your kimono would be pretty plain, but the inside would have like this flashy you know, um, lining. And, you know, depending on how you move, people could see that or they developed their own sort of patterns. And then that became prestigious because it was a certain kind of fashion that was associated with fashion. Um, so those are that's the traditional type of sumptuary laws. They also existed in certain forms in Europe where it's very much about maintaining a certain class hierarchy. What happened in Italy in the Renaissance period is different. And that's what you were talking about with the fines. The, so these were all merchant-run city-states, basically. I mean, the governance was a little bit different, but basically the merchants were in charge. So you wouldn't think merchants would pass laws like these because generally speaking, sumptuary laws are all about keeping rich people in their place. It's like not letting, you know, maintaining an aristocracy that isn't based on wealth. So you wouldn't expect it's a place like Renaissance Florence, where the rich people, based on trade, are running the city, pass these. What seems to have happened there is essentially what they're trying to do is write into law a cartel that would control their household budgets so that they would stop trying to keep up with the Joneses, whatever, or their wives and daughters would stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Um, and so they would say you couldn't have this certain kind of pattern or you could only you couldn't have buttons. Now, we think of buttons as like these plastic things that aren't worth very much. But this is before plastic and buttons were often silver, or gold. They were valuable. They were sort of they had a value separate from the garment they were on. Um, so they'd have all these rules. They can't have the certain kind of figures of animals can't be embroidered, whatever it might be. But they were totally unable to maintain these rules. And so what they ended up doing is they start out saying, well, if you break the law, there's this fine. And so they say, if you, you know, you don't have your, if you have more than your certified number of dresses wearing in public, you have to pay a fine or whatever. Or, or there are these very short tunics that men would wear. They're like mini skirts for men. You'd have to pay a fine to, if you wanted to wear those. Then the fine basically became a fee because it, it was like officially a fine, but really everybody just paid it. And then it became a way of funding the government of, you know, paying the army or whatever uh, because they couldn't keep it up. But yeah, it's, it's a very different world from the war, one that we're in, at least as regard clothes. I mean, there are other things. I mean, we have sumptuary-ish kinds of laws. Um, 
around, um, you know, they're, they're, you're not allowed to, you know, take your groceries home in a plastic bag or you're not, I mean, mm. it's ours tend, it's not exactly analogous, but we do tend to have like rules that are often around environmental things uh, or uh, they may be largely symbolic, like you're not allowed to have plastic straws or something like that. Uh, that's the closest analogy that I can think of to sumptuary laws uh, that we have, but they're actually quite common throughout human history. Uh, huh. Usually, usually trying to maintain not the Renaissance way where you pay the fine, but usually trying to maintain a social hierarchy against the pressures of people getting rich and just buying their way, um, you know, it, into what, whatever the nice clothes are or, or whatever. Yeah. That's a really interesting way of framing it. Like when you said keeping up with the Joneses, I think that's something that it, it may be embedded in human nature to have this desire and that there's yeah. this law in place to, or this set of rules to try and prevent people from doing that. Um, is, is there any hope for some, for a strategy like that? Like you mentioned, this didn't really work. It eventually became, you know, it, it eventually kind of phased out and it, it turned from a, uh, it was first a, a fine and then a fee and then a license. It was kind of like a broad, right. like exactly. everyone did it. Just became um, a way of raising money for the government after a while. Yeah. yeah. Which I guess is that was something that is realistic to maintain. Well, it depends on your society. So, you know, in Japan, people followed the sumptuary laws, but they created a different way around it. You know, they just created their own fashions within those constraints. And then those fashions became more uh, more um fashionable mm -hmm. you know, more prestigious um even though so i i do think what you see from the history of sumptuary laws is trying to prevent people who make money through commerce from participating in whatever is prestigious in society is very difficult. Um, that they will, you know, trying to stigmatize commerce um, tends to not work. I won't say it never works because I'm sure we can come up with examples of, of places, times and places where it, it, it's worked. And certainly even in, in China, um, those those people didn't enjoy the prestige that people who were Mandarin scholars and worked in the government enjoyed. Um, they just had, you know, more money. <laughs> That's fair. Okay, I want to finish this off with a talk about the future of fabric. So we looked back at the past, and we've seen all the different ways that fabric has been kind of woven into the lives of people um, in economics, in politics, in technology, chemistry, science, everything. Um, when you look forward, what do you think, what do you, what do you think about when you think about the future of fabric? And, and right. you know, you mentioned at the beginning that fabric is now so, it's so cheap to produce. It's everywhere. We all have easy access to it. Does that trend continue? Is there another level of cost reduction that make that could make fabric uh, even more useful and, and have more a, a wider array of applications. Um, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the next like 100 right. years of fabric. What does that look like? Well, there, there are several different strains. Um, if you're actually looking at the production, one thing that's happening already and will happen more and more is using the interface of so software and um, three-dimensional knitting machines. So typical knitted garment, like a t-shirt, is made out of cloth that is, it, it's manufactured by knitting like a giant tube, basically, and then cutting that tube to make flat cloth and then cutting that cloth into pieces and sewing them together. So like, you know, the front and back of the t-shirt and the sleeves and all that. Uh, 
that's a very inexpensive way of making the cloth and 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 the cut and sew is the expensive part the the cloth the production is cheap the sewing a little less so although it's been automated in a lot of ways too however you can there are other types of knitting machines that date back only to the 90s so they've been around for you know a while but they're not that will knit say a whole shirt in one piece and this is not just the one we keep inevitably when we talk about textiles and whether it's knitting or weaving we talk about clothes but a big thing that is knitted today are sneakers and and that's a lot of shoes um you can take these three-dimensional knitting machines and you can program them to knit every part of the sneaker except the sole the rubber sole but you can knit it has a different stitch for the arch it has a different stitch you know the density is different different where you put the shoelaces the the back of the heel all that so you end up with this funny shaped piece and then you just fold it together and put the sole on and you've got a sneak um and all the major companies are starting to do this at least in experimental um models um, it's not it's not yet the main way they make sneakers but that's a way um i think this is very big it's it's very big for a number of reasons whether you're talking about shoes or you're talking about clothes uh you can put the production closer to the final consumer uh you can customize more um Without getting into details, it's a lot easier to set up a knitting machine, like to change the color of the yarn or whatever, than it is to set up a loom, which is one reason that knitting is just generally displacing weaving. There are other reasons too, but it's. Um, so I think that's a, a case of something that is already happening and that is, you know, going to happen more and more in the future. It reduces a lot of waste, um, a lot of things there. Um, I mentioned earlier people trying to put um, computing into garments. To some degree, that's still, um, you know, there are technological issues about trying to get it to work, but there's also issues of like, why do, why would people want it? What would they use it for? Um, there, you know, at this point, there, the, early applications tend to be things like uh monitoring the body temperatures of uh soldiers in extreme conditions uh less that you know things like that you know the military puts a lot of money into this uh, we'll see where that goes there it's uh there are people working on uh, bioengineering both fibers and dyes so that you I write in the book about bolt threads, which has since pivoted to a, a, a different application, but um, to making substitutes for leather. But they bioengineer yeast so that it excretes silk proteins, not uh, in this case ones that are like fiber, uh, like spider silk. Um, that in, so instead of you know it's like brewing beer only. Instead of making alcohol, you make these silk proteins, and then you can distill those and spin them into thread mm. that, now it's very hard to it's very hard to get that cost competitive but that's something that we might see as synthetic biology marches on uh, uh, there are also people uh, working on dyes similarly uh, there's a company called q h u u e in, in the bay area that is working on making indigo uh using similarly you know use bioengineered organisms to excrete the the compounds you want and, and uh, produce that and that potentially has a lot of these are driven by environmental concerns you know you uh, compared to alternatives right and then there is a whole lot of concern a lot if you if you look at where textile people people who are in the industry are putting a lot of their research it, it it is around issues of you know um decreasing the environmental imprint 
uh, impact uh, footprint. <laughs> I'm trying to say um, <laughs> the uh, one of those words. Um, and and this is you know, I think people have the misunderstanding. They think that in the olden times textile production, dyeing, whatever, didn't have an environmental impact. And now because we have technology, it does. It's not really that. It's it's just a matter of scale. Like dyeing, for example, was always messy. It was, I don't care how far back you go, it was always stinky, it used a lot of water, it was polluting, what it, you know, doesn't matter if it was coming from plants or animals, it, but the difference is scale. So you could just make the people go on the other side of town or in a different city or, or, uh, on, but now we have this scale. And so people are looking at, you know, how do you clean that up? How do you, I talk about, I go to a, in the book, I go to a, a dye house in LA of all places. And, and they really have significantly reduced the, the uh, environmental impacts of their work how much energy they use, how what their pollution and everything. And it's all by incremental little uh, changes over time. Um, but people, there is a, a lot of concern around just the sheer volume of textile waste, whether that's waste at the, the factory level or, you know, stuff that's being thrown away or just people's old clothes or whatever, you know, can, it, are there, ways that they could be recycled or reused. And, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of energy going into that, a lot of money going into that. Um, uh, it's it's a difficult problem, partly because some of the things that we really like, like blended fa fabrics, um, that uh, if, if, you, if you're looking to recycle, like you don't want a cotton polyester blend or polyester with spandex. You want just polyester, so you can just melt it down and turn it into more polyester. Um, but, and then you have to collect it and all this. And this is why most of it, there is a lot of recycled polyester out there in the market, but it mostly comes from bottles. So, huh. Like soda oh. bottles, because they're easier to collect. And Yeah. On episode one of this show, I had on uh, an author, Mark Levinson. He was talking mm -hmm. about his book yeah. called The Box, and it was about all about shipping. And yeah. one of the questions I asked him was what the future of shipping looked like and if something like 3D printing would eat into global shipping. And he thought potentially it could. Now, I didn't think at all about 3D knitting. And <laughs> I, I also haven't thought much about, you know, I, I've, I've seen people designing like miniature homes, uh, like prefab, like 3D right, cement right. mixed homes. And I wonder uh, what the implications of all of this are because – like, am I going to be able to one day print my T-shirt at home and just kind of like download a file from H and M or some my favorite you know retailer or uh, whatever and just yeah have it appear? I mean, you could probably do that today. I mean, there are three D knitting machines. Well, actually, I don't know what the, the home knitting machine is three D, but it, I mean, it's gonna. If I don't think we're talking about producing clothes at home much. I think mm -hmm. we're talking about produce, producing clothes in smaller batches closer to the consumer, but not not in your living room. <laughs> you know, um, so that instead of having you know one giant factory in China, you would have a lot of little factories, and they would be scattered about the world. Um, now, um, how does that change the? Energy. How does that change the shape of cities? Because I, I think about a lot of North American cities. And many of them near their rail lines and near their downtown cores have old loft buildings that were traditionally like garment manufacturing buildings. Right. And they've now been converted into, you know, people's lofts or, you know, nice uh, right. industrial, right. you know, right. some other application. Um, what changes about the way that maybe it's cities or malls or shopping districts, what changes about that? when we can do all these uh, 3D yeah. technologies well, at scale. One, you know, one, well, one thing that's interesting is to think about whether you, and I don't know, you know, it's speculative, but whether you might combine uh, sort of the, the shopping experience with the manufacturing experience. So maybe you have, you know, a mall, let's call it, or, you know, a mall, which places that people browse and select and, and then another part of it is, 
actually where they have machines that make the the garments. I mean, it's conceivable. Um, it, again, this is this is not cheaper. You know, this is us saying, well, we don't want cheaper. We want more varied. We want different. We want, you know, I want to be able to design my own sneakers or my own. I mean, I did go, uh, one of the places I went to uh, is a company called Spoonflower, which people who know about it think it's huge, but it's really small. But it's, it's in an office park in Research Triangle, North Carolina. Um, and it it is a place that will uses um, uh, uh, printing on demand to print fabric. So uh, it takes you know plain you know white cloth, some of it's cotton, some of it's polyester. They have you know, um, and you can select files from their website, or you can upload your own file and have a design that you want so you can get you know if you want to make baby clothes that's a big application uh with a unique pattern you can do that if you want something for your kitchen you know kitchen curtains that are different or whatever you can do that um and it will print as little as a yard for you mm. of your unique pattern and i saw you know and the way that you watch the stuff come off the line and it's got like you know there'll be one pattern of i don't know so red polka dots and then the next and then like just a yard later there'll be some uh you know all over sophisticated pattern of that looks like wallpaper or something you know it'll be all these different kinds of things uh, and that's i mean they're shipping these by you know they just mail them or to you or whatever but they, it's very small batch very specialized and they was quite tricky getting started because the technology the, the um the sort of inkjet printing wasn't ready for fabric at that point but um it, it is now and they've sort of grown up with this company Cornet, which is an israeli company that makes um this these machines for printing on fabric which is another thing that is again computer driven i mean a lot of these things have to do with the interface between software and some kind of machine that is involved in the textile process so in this case it's a you know printing designs and it took a while to get it because it's easier to print on paper than it is to print on cloth but um that sort of uh printing printing ha um printing has yeah. really spread in recent years like over the last 10 years or so not just at the tiny scale, but also at larger scales. Are there any specific uh, use cases that you think fabric has never been able to do before, but may one day be able to do? And I'm thinking about things like, you know, I look at like a seatbelt and how mm -hmm. tightly, I guess it's woven or knit, but woven, it, the, yeah, it's, yeah it's so tight that it, it becomes this really strong thing that can prevent you from getting injured in an accident. I imagine 50 years before a seatbelt came out, no one was really thinking about, you know, safety, like, that a fabric would like prevent you from, you know, getting into an accident. But here it is, uh, preventing right. everyone from getting into getting injured in accidents. Yeah. What, no, what comes next? Like, are there interesting, I don't that's know, super strength fabrics or anything that can kind of like change the way people think about fabric? Well, there is a whole category of fabric that I don't talk about in the book because I can't talk about everything. And that is what's known in the industry as non-wovens. So if you're going to go back in history and write about non-wovens, you would write about felt. Mm -hmm. um, but, but nowadays, non-wovens are really, really important. It's everything from uh, what's inside uh, uh, disposable diapers or, or masks, um, uh, you know, N95 masks or that. they're not a lot of these things are, they're not really you may think they're paper but they're really considered a textile um that and they're made up of lots of little fibers some of which are for some applications these are unbelievably tiny i mean they're 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 mic measured in microns um 
and they're used for all kinds of filtration and things like that. So I think if I were going to look for applications that we haven't thought of, I would probably look in the area of non-wovens, but I don't know as much about that in that part of the industry uh, as as uh, I might, <laughs> you know, if I if I had devoted uh, um, more of my book. And then, of course, there's also like carbon fiber and things like that, which are a kind of fiber, but not really a kind of textile. Right. So, would a non-woven that would be something like a HEPA air filter, for HEPA example? Air filter would be an example. Yeah. Got it. And then carbon fiber, we're seeing that being used in all sorts of, I, I know it from athletic experience, yeah, playing yeah. With hockey sticks and running yeah, shoes. And yeah, there's all right, sorts of stuff right, there. right. And that's not really a textile, but sometimes mm -hmm. people ask me, do you write about carbon fiber? Well, it is a fiber, but it's not, not a textile, but yeah. And, and since you mentioned athletics, you know, it really is the case today that performance textiles, um, some of it's first responder, like really out, I mentioned military applications, but a lot of it is um, athletics, you know, figuring out where, how you can enhance athletic performance or athletic comfort or prevent injuries. You know, people do a lot of work on the textiles that are used in, in those applications. And a lot of it is about designing from the yarn up which now, again, you know, looking at the computer, the, the, they're, they're starting to model. So you, have, you can have a database that's models of different yarns that are actually existing in the world. And, and you can, you know, sort of design your garment starting with the characteristics of that yarn and see if it will accomplish what you're, what you're looking to accomplish. Yeah. I imagine there's got to be a lot of untapped potential there in athletics yeah. to find things that like, cause every sport has a unique requirement, right? Like yeah. in, in running, maybe in long distance running, you're maybe looking for the lightest and most breathable thing right. in a contact sport. Maybe you're looking for something that's going to hold up against torsion or some kind of, uh, impact. And I, I, I spend some time, I write a little bit about this, but I, I, I spent some time at under all, uh, uh, under armor and, one of I can't remember the sport, but they were actually designing garments differently for different positions. So, like hmm. for, for I don't think it was football though. Maybe it was maybe it was soccer. But anyway, for different positions because what that like the way you move in that position is different from. So it's within the. It's not even just varied by the sport, but varied by the position within the sport. Right, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, Virginia, this has been an incredible conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed reading the book and then speaking with you about it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, before you go, where can listeners go to learn more about you and your work? Okay, so I have a, a website at vpostrel.com, which has most things. I also have a sub stack. So that's vpostrel.substack.com. Um, and I have a YouTube channel that has some videos about uh, uh, textiles, mostly. Um, that and the, the one on bandanas is particularly popular. <laughs> uh, so, and that's just—I think it's just Virginia Postrel. But if you if you Google uh, on uh, if you do a search on YouTube, you can find them there. Perfect. Great. Thank you again for taking the time, and um, thank you for writing this book.